Hello everyone, and thanks for joining. We know that some of you have been waiting patiently and anticipating this vehicle for a very long time. We're very pleased with the interaction we're now having with our car on the European roads in our testing. We hope it is going to exceed your expectations. If you need to, and haven't already, you can enable the captions in this broadcast in your local language. As many of you know from previous communications, it's been a tough and challenging year, but I'm delighted to confirm that production for our pre-order customers will start soon, and we're on track for the first deliveries to arrive in Europe in spring 2021. This is when we also expect our dealers to start being able to offer test drives. We'll notify you via email when you can make a booking. For all customers who have pre-ordered a Mach-E, we'll need you to confirm your Mustang Mach-E order. The process has already kicked off in Norway and we'll shortly be inviting customers in the UK, Germany, France, the Netherlands and Switzerland by email. The current plan is that invitations should go out from the beginning of December. You don't need to pay any more money at this stage as we'll contact you about payment options later. After you've had a chance to confirm your order, we will open up ordering to additional countries. We've received a number of questions in recent weeks about pre-order numbers. Please be assured the numbers have been randomly generated and we're scheduling production using your pre-order date as much as possible. Nevertheless, we do recommend that you confirm your order as soon as possible. Once you have confirmed your order, we'll keep you informed of the order progress by email and within your Ford account. For all customers in our other European countries, we'll be opening up our new online sales platform and starting to take orders from quarter one, 2021. And you can expect deliveries to commence in late spring. You will hear from us by email when you can place your order. We're going to hear shortly from a variety of team members with whom I've been working to give you a behind the scenes view of how the Mustang Mach-E was brought to life. From design to engineering, as well as the team responsible for delivering the advanced technology and connected experience in the car. We will be available afterwards via our Twitter account to answer your questions. If you have any that spring to mind during the webinar, please send them through and our community managers will be on hand to support and feed them through to us. We'll hear from Jason Castriotta and Chris Walters in our exterior design team to explain the process they went through to design our Mustang Mach-E. So now we're going to dive into the design journey for the Mustang Mach-E, and this is, this is where the real fun begins. You know, as you're probably aware, Mustang is now 55, 56 years old, actually, and there is 56 years of history. You know, above all, there's that long, powerful front hood, that fist punching through the air, the powerful rear haunches, and that fast roof line. You then dive into the details, like the tri-bar headlamps, and these are things that we knew we had to carry forward, but do it in a new, fresh way, a way that signed that this was the future of Mustang, that we were pushing the brand forward without forgetting where we came from. But the added challenge to this program, of course, is we were taking what has been traditionally, again, for over 55 years, a two-door coupe body style and pulling it into a four-door SUV body style. So this really required radical change in the vehicle architecture. When we started this program years ago, the initial concept was to do a all electric SUV and the initial proposals would have been handsome vehicles for sure, but they weren't going to deliver Mustang style, Mustang proportion or Mustang performance. So Chris and I worked together with the team, the engineering team to really look at the vehicle architecture and see how could we change the bones of the vehicle as we like to refer to them as and really push and pull the vehicle to deliver those Mustang proportions. And all of this had added benefits for the interior space and also for the battery, allowing us to pack a larger battery in, larger motors in, which would give us the range and the performance that we knew we needed Mustang to have. So Chris, why don't you jump in and let's talk a little bit together about how we pushed and pulled the architecture together with the engineering team to ensure we got that Mustang aesthetic. 
Thanks, Jason. Um, like Jason said, you know, proportions, um, it's, it's the language of car design. And when you've got beautiful proportions, you know, it's you know, really it's, the first thing that you want to try to nail down because it makes your job so much easier. Right. But so, you know, Mustang's got great proportions and, you know, we talked about the shark nose up front. We talked about the, uh, the long hood, right? We talked about the short overhangs. Uh, we pushed the front wheel forward. Uh, we pushed the rear wheel, the rear wheel back. Um, Jason talked about the, the fast roof line. So it's got this kind of a curved uninterrupted roof rail that runs all the way back. But, you know, it's very clever on what we did to uh, retain uh, rear occupant seat, seat space, but uh, from, from a nice design trick and uh, uh, kind of uh, the way we executed the, the product, it, it looks very, has very, a nice coupe silhouette. So, you know, all these things, right? Even, even when it comes to, you don't see it in the side view graphic, but if you think about the rear haunches, we really tried to uh, accentuate the width. Yeah, it's a great way of putting it. You know, as, as Chris mentioned, you know, it's, it's the aggregate of all these design and architecture changes that really give us the proportions, those supermodel proportions that Mustangs have to have. And, you know, the end result, as I mentioned, also gave us greater interior space and greater battery range and performance. So it was really a win across the board for the program. And, you know, the other thing is, is that once we knew we were really able to deliver Mustang performance, then the, let's say, the excitement, the enthusiasm around delivering our first all-electric vehicle as a Mustang just got turned to 11. What we first called Mustang-inspired proposals, but these actually became very quickly the Mustang Mach-E proposals. And when I sat, started out with this program, I was actually originally the chief designer and Chris was my design manager. We started out with three main directions. And one was really about, again, playing to that idea of how do we really move Mustang forward? How do we build a far more progressive, fluid aesthetic that we know our younger customers in particular were gonna really appreciate and that would begin to move Mustang to a new generation of buyer. Uh, the second, group of proposals we really built around a very pure, minimal aesthetic, um, you know, a bit more global in its aesthetic in the sense that it had a very premium feel to it. Uh, and then the final language, of course, was really copy and paste. How do we take today's existing Mustang design cues, a beautiful vehicle and, and really stunning on the road? How do we take those proportions and design cues and apply them directly to an SUV? And from there, you know, Chris and I really let the team run. But, you know, there was this feeling that the, the future of emotive power, which is really what we wanted to convey with this vehicle, was the winner. Chris, why don't you, why don't you take it from here and, and talk a bit more to the, the process and what this really represented in this, this first sculptural image. And then, of course, we'll share more after that. Okay. You know, Jason mentioned Jason. the future of emotive power. And we answered that with with sculpture, more sensual surfacing, uh, just more emotive, um, you know? And it was, you know, it was really, really pushing it. And like electric vehicles are something different and people expect electric vehicles to be different, but they don't need to be weird. They don't need to be a science project. So we wanted to, you know, make it modern and beautiful, you know, make it modern, but make it beautiful and sculptural and sensual at the same time, but also mix in those really iconic Mustang cues. We need to add the signature cues to refine the design and you'll see more, more of that uh, as we progress. Well, this is um, um, part of the story that I call Unleash the Designers. So in the beginning of Jason, he mentioned that the car didn't start out uh, the way it ended up. Uh, so in the beginning, there wasn't a whole lot of emotion behind that original design and layout. And the proportions were not as exciting. And we could just sense that the, the team felt that. But, but when we, when we uh, worked with the engineering and we, and, and we really pushed the company into this new direction and the architecture was reimagined to really help achieve these truly Mustang proportions, you know, that just, that just went through like lightning with the entire design team, you know, across the globe. And everyone was really hungry to put the uh, proverbial pen to paper and just let those creative juices run wild. And, you know, the designers just had so many, so many uh, sketches. They were, it was just so hard to choose from. But in the prior slide, you, you remember that Jason had laid out those three pillars or those three 
kind of uh, lanes that we that we kind of funneled these sketches into. Um, but it was just so exciting to see how many great concepts we had, and um, you know, this this was at a stage that we had to move quickly, and uh, we know that we we couldn't stay in this in this phase too long. Yeah, I think um, one one of the the intriguing things is is that just how iterative a process uh, the design process really is. And as Chris mentioned, you know, Ford being a global motor company, um, we have design studios all over the world, and whether or not designers were officially involved or not, we, we got designs from all over the world coming in, uh, pouring in actually on a daily basis. And, you know, when you see a, a sketchboard like this, which is just showing, you know, three or four different design directions, that's a, that's a day's work from one or two designers. Now, now multiply that by several, several, several uh, you know, tens of hundreds of people. Um, you can imagine just how many designs were coming our way. One of the things we did to really accelerate development, and this is something we were really excited about, and Chris will dive much more into this, was really leveraging the latest tools. You know, designing a really progressive vehicle, we felt it was really necessary to put on our, you know, our own technology hats and utilize VR really as the driving force to accelerate the vehicle development. You know, we wanted to get to market exceptionally fast with this vehicle for a reason. And we felt we had a, a great, great clear idea of where we wanted to go and that we could actually chunk a lot of time and energy out of the process by leveraging these digital tools. It's really critical to note that, you know, what, what working full time in digital gives you is that ability to overlay engineering together with the design at all times. So, you know, when we think back to, you know, a couple of slides ago when we were sharing that kind of push and pull of the vehicle architecture, you know, there's scores of engineers working on trying to make sure that the vehicle is structurally safe, that it's going to be uh, you know, dynamic in its drive. Everything's going to be as light as it can be, um, but be strong. So. The fact that we could work with them hand in hand, really hand in glove, millimeter by millimeter, as we continue to stretch that wheelbase or lower the roof or pull that wind screen rearward. Um, these were all tremendous cost and time saving tools for us. So uh, really added value across the board. And, and our young design team uh, really did a fantastic job of learning new programs, new tools and immediately applying them. And it's just been a fantastic growth process for everybody involved. Chris, why don't you take them through uh, this moment here? Well, um, like we said earlier, we were working all these models in CAD and VR. This was the time that we actually went into the physical realm <laughs> and we modeled these cars, uh, cut these cars on the mill in clay and dressed them up for a, a presentation to our design leadership and uh, management in the company. And this was a beautiful day at the design headquarters on the courtyard. And this was um, this was September. So we started the new design process in July. So here we are just a couple months later. And because of those tools, those digital tools we were using, we had three full scale design models to present to our, our senior leadership. Yeah, I you're right, Jason. I mean, it really cut out a lot of time. Usually this was a process that would more than likely take maybe even six to eight months. It seemed like we did it in the span of about three. It just, it was yeah. really quick or less. Um, uh, Chris, why don't you run them through what, what our leadership and others said when, when they actually saw these vehicles? Well, they were, I think they were really blown away. They were really excited. Uh, because this 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 project was a really, if you can imagine, this project was was a was really hard for a lot of folks to get their head around. Um, we mentioned all electric Mustang SUV, and where it's it's never been either one of those things before. But I think when we had these models in the courtyard, and the, you could tell the excitement, uh, you could see that people were starting to get it. And um, it started playing into that narrative that you started out with Jason about a new hero and, and how we can stand out in the crowd. And that really, I think was, you know, it was, it's, it's really, I, this product, I think at that moment in time, our management started understanding that this is going to challenge the status quo in the EV market going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um... You know, again, one of, one of the exciting points here in this review was, you know, we had been working fast and furiously for a couple months, as, as Chris mentioned, but ultimately, you know, the response was, went from, boy, I don't know if we can do a Mustang SUV that's electric, because it's that two bridges that you're crossing at once, to, 
wow, this is this is something. And yeah, we, we need to push it. If we're going to push it, let's push it all the way. Let's let's really push for the more progressive design. And you know that for for a design team is about as exciting as it gets. So, you know, we came out of that presentation. I'm sorry, I'll I'll switch back one more moment here, where we really as a team believed in the future of emotive power, but we knew we needed to bring in a little bit more of today's Mustang. And so that that pure and minimal proposal in the middle really became married with the future of emotive power to create something that we we felt was really strong and. You know, Chris and I, right after this review, we, we sat down with, with a couple of the designers that were directly involved with those models, and we spoke to them. And literally within a couple of days of sketching together, we came up with this design model here that you see. And you see the wireframe on the left, because once again, what did we do? We went right back into the CAD model data, and we're able to very quickly iterate together on this new design proposal. And uh, Chris, why don't you walk them through the, you know, the BR and the milling of that and, and the time frame that this all happened. Oh, wow. You know, it happened, it happened really quickly. So the future of automotive power, that was the theme, like Jason said. Um, we just felt that it was a good balance. Um, back into the CAD, back into the BR. We had something that we liked. We felt that it had the spirit to look, future, look to the future and beyond. And we milled it out and we... You can see the, the, the clay model in the, in the lower right-hand corner. We didn't even completely dress the model. Uh, yeah. You know, our clay models, uh, we cover the clay models with a vinyl-type material, and you, you, you wet it down with water, and it sticks to the clay. You can stretch it. Stand back about 20 feet. looks like a real car. So we didn't even, you can see, we didn't even, we just did the body side, we taped a few graphics, we got the graphics of the, of the, the, the side glass, the DLO, and the roof line. We stood back and that was like, that was like our eureka moment. We were like, okay, so this is the car. This is, this is it. Um, yeah, that, that was the moment. I, you know, I remember we, we literally decided to mill the car on Wednesday because we have a standing, uh, I had a standing review with Murray Callum, our, our design VP. And I said to Chris, we, we got to get this in front of Murray right away. And Friday, and that was a nice Friday fall day, uh, very, very early October. So just a handful, of, a couple of weeks after, really, that presentation out in the courtyard in late September. And, you know, we showed a, you know, a half finished, half Dynock, uh, you know, mo model to uh, Murray and the design uh, leadership. And uh, everybody agreed, this is, this is really the way to go. This is it, guys. We, we're on to something here. And, and from there, it was really about all the refinement uh, that new had to go into it. Once you get over that that hump of what is this, you know, what what is the thematically the main design, then it's really into the weeds of the refinement, and that's that's a whole new fun process unto itself. Because at this point, you know, you're really futuring the iconic details of Mustang. So this is going to have ramifications not just for this vehicle, but also in the next generation of, of Mustang Coupe. So Chris, walk them through how you led the team um, to really really deliver and just turn this vehicle to 11 with, with the great detail work and the refinement that went into the design from that point. And uh, we wanted to add signature cues and refinements. Um, if you look at the sketches on here on the left, um, pulling inspiration from the front end. Uh, if you look at the uh, details on the headlamps, it, it has a tri-bar motif, uh, much, much like the tri-bar motif on the rear lamps. So it, it's like a, it's a theme that runs from the front through the rear of the car. Um, the rear end graphics, uh, again, just the, the, the wide rear stance. Look at the implied grill, uh, the sketch that, uh, uh, that inspired the front end of the vehicle. We uh, call that kind of our implied grill shape. Uh, it, it was kind of, a, we dubbed it the horse collar. And it's kind of this, this disguised grill motif. It, it also frames, uh, you know, the, the new and the fresh take on our classic running horse or pony. So, you know, again, it's an electric vehicle. So does it, it didn't need per se a grill. Uh, again, like looking into the future, uh, trying to uh, work it out with uh, emotional and, and, and sensual surfaces. Uh, and it's also a smooth, clean surface uh, up front. You know, it delivers great aerodynamics. So again, trying to take those iconic Mustang details and featuring them. It was, it was uh, just putting the last bit of seasoning on the car. Great way of putting it. 
So, you know, this really brings us to what became the final theme model. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, Chris, Chris, you know, rightfully called it the Eureka moment, that, that clay model that we milled really quickly, uh, and then adding some of the character of the detail work that the team was doing. Um, this is when the car really took, took shape. And this was the first time uh, in this form here that we actually showed it to the most senior leaders in Ford Motor Company. This was an exciting moment. And, um, you know, showing a, you know, a new red Mustang is, is always a great way to get your, uh, your top leader's attention. Um, there was no doubting at this point we had a winner and, and, you know, we needed to push this forward. And from there, you know, the design just continued to be refined. Um, Chris and the team did a phenomenal job of really giving, you know, what we refer to as almost giving love to the, to the surfaces, really tremendous care and sensibility, you know, because, you know, great cars, there's that old adage that, you know, you want to wash them yourself, right? You don't want to, you don't want to throw it through the car wash. You actually want to take the time and care to actually, you know, have this relationship with your vehicle. And, and Mustangs are, are one of those iconic vehicles that, you know, we know that our Mustang owners and fans um, really appreciate them. You know, when you, when you drive the car and you put it away and start walking away, you turn back and look at it again. And, and that's something that we knew we could really bring with the Mustang Mach-E. And that kind of concludes the story of how we got there. It's pretty clear. Chris and I actually had a lot of fun, you know, over this couple of years, a lot of challenges. I mean, we were probably downplaying playing some of the challenges to a degree. Uh, you know, birthing a, a new Mustang after 55 years of, of a history of a phenomenal coupe, um, you know, crossing double bridges uh, was really, you know, a unique professional challenge, personal challenge for all of us. And, um, you know, we couldn't be prouder of the team, of the company, uh, of the trust we were given, the opportunity we were given, and above all, the results that we now share with you today. I'm so happy that we're able to speak to you tonight. This is a, a very special product. The world is only just seeing what this vehicle can do. In my 29 years of developing vehicles and launching Mustang actually uh, in some regions, I don't think I've seen a vehicle that's had a better reaction to this when we take it out on the road. We're currently in the final testing now and every other few days we're handing back the car and going back to our ordinary cars, and none of us want to hand back our car each time it happens. But tonight we're here to talk about the um, SYNC 4A system, the human machine interface of this car. And it's really the heart of this car and the story about how that was developed. It, it's developed in a way we've never done in any car we've ever had. Um, and we wanted the real people that did that development to be able to talk to you. Now, I've got to tell you, we, when we started this car, we believe we need to make a new type of HMI on this vehicle that's very easy to use. And we used a new method called human-centric development to do this. And that gets you out and testing with real customers really early on. So it started off being it's a new HMI and must work really uh, pro proactively and really simply. But it ended up something completely different. It ended up a system that gets to know you. It's personalized to you. It has all of your content, your apps, simultaneously with zero learning curve. We believe it's the best system on the market. We may be slightly biased and we don't think there's anything like it similar. So we're absolutely delighted to share with you the story of how it was developed and also show you a few more uh, tips and tricks who led up our software development team during this process. Hussein. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Hussein. I was part of an amazing team that uh, brought you um, this next generation sync. So today we'll, we're going to talk a little about the background, our thought process on um, uh, the, the system, 
and what we wanted to accomplish. From the beginning, uh, how it all started, uh, we wanted to kind of deliver something that's unique and new uh, for our Maki customers. Uh, we wanted to rethink everything from the ground up. What are our customers using our system for in our daily drive? Uh, in their daily drive and what are they trying to address you're kind of the pictures here you're seeing uh, kind of behind the scenes um uh when our management when darren and, and our management wanted to uh come up with this new concept we we brought the entire team together so amazing team members from our studio our hmi team and also our software development team and we all sat in this uh kind of abandoned little room in the back of a building uh, that was kind of the only place that fits all of us. A few of our top experts in the company huddle up in the space that you guys are seeing here and just start prototyping, building something customers really want. And we looked in the field um, in automotive, things were a little more traditional in terms of design and interaction. We wanted, again, to develop something next gen. So some of the myths that we dispelled for ourselves, we, we thought, well, phones and tablets are very swipey, so maybe you yeah. need to swipe. So some of the concepts had a lot of swiping in it. And yeah. it was only when we started testing it with real customers and, and frankly putting them in a car and seeing how it feels when you drive, we realized, yeah, swiping's good when you're looking at the screen, but yeah. you're driving a car. You're not supposed to be looking yeah. at the screen. And it doesn't work for that. So, so we, those ones didn't work at all, and we put them aside. And another one we were trying, you know, everybody was talking about, you know, I just want to get to the volume control easily. And so we ended up with this physical volume control. We said, what if, and we put, we, we had a swivel control, we put it on a TV, started using it, and we tested that quickly, and everybody loved the physical control knob. Bonded to the screen, um, not as most traditional cars, separate and so it's actually bonded to onto the screen and you can see through that control knob and it uses a certain technology it's not wired to the screen the screen detects the control knob and when we tested that people went crazy for it so because you now got a combination of physical control and touch screen i, I think the some of the memories i have of, of developing this is the discussions so you'll notice on the next slide We'll go through uh, kind of in depth uh, some of the aspects of uh, our modern HMI and our our um, kind of uh, interaction and whatnot. So here, with what we, what we were trying to accomplish, as, as you notice here, our design team did a fantastic job with bringing in a fresh new a theme. Um, again, this is sometimes things that. Um, are brushed to the side when building an overall vehicle. Uh, uh, automotive companies traditionally are looking to invest in certain areas. But now, I mean, with this new age, software is important. And uh, what, do, what do you think, Darren, uh, about kind of the, the theming part of it? I know that's one thing that you really pushed us hard on, kind of a modern theme and modern UI. Yeah, so, yeah, so another one of the things we learned as we went was um, we were looking at what do people want? And we started at, oh, you know, um, I want certain things on the screen. And then we speak to the next person and they want something different. And the next person, something different. So the realization was people, I want my stuff. Trouble is everybody's stuff is different. And so one of the principles of the system is that you see the main screen there at the top and there's these cards. As you used it, the things you use most will move to the top. And after we find after about an hour, all of the things that you commonly use will be at the front. And you'll notice that the cards at the bottom are still usable. So while you have nav up, you can answer a phone call, mute the call, or even call key contacts. And you can also change the radio stations or, the, or select the music or the audio or one of the streaming services without taking the main nav off the screen. If you want to go deeper, you can just touch the card at the bottom, it expands, and then you, you're deeper into that item. And, and something else people loved is the navigation. Full screen navigation on a 15 and a half inch screen is a beautiful thing. And it has graphics of all the buildings as well. It looks beautiful. So a lot of us, as we use this system, we find we, we maximize the nav and we're running there. And then we can still use phone calls, changing radio stations, and so on at the same time. On the next slide, um, we kind of show 
uh, a little more on the personalization aspect of things. We show the ability to create a profile. So as customers, you'll be able to create a profile, save the many settings uh, that you have in the vehicle to that profile. So just by creating the profile, everything you already have in the settings automatically links to that profile. And as you create a, a different profile, so if Darren comes in the vehicle and he starts adjusting his settings, it's automatically getting saved to his profile. And then you can save the kind of the profile both to your uh, fob, to your phone, and as you're approaching uh, the vehicle, it automatically tunes up everything to your profile and your liking. I mean, it's a fundamental of the car. That it, what we, we learned as we did this is all about it adjusting to you. So when you walk up to this car, the phone is the key. Your phone is the key. It already loads your profile in. The electronic door lock system feeds the door to you. You open it with one finger, sit down, and it's already set to your profile. All of your settings, your radio stations, your favorite teams, the position of the uh, seats, um, the heating controls, the temperature, everything's set to you. Um, And, of course, it can be set to other members of your family as well. Um, You can even put your photograph in here, uh, which is uh, something we thought was really important to personalize it for you. You can choose your own or you can choose uh, avatars there as well. Um, and that and that's the key. And and the thing I love most about the system is that um, it, it can also use CarPlay and Android Auto. One thing, as as Darren mentioned, we're looking to provide customers with um, kind of uh, adaptive experience to what they want. And we'll talk a little about uh, cloud, our cloud connectivity within the system. So the system Sync Four in general was redesigned from the ground up to take uh, full advantage uh, of our high speed connectivity in the vehicle. Um, so one, one of the baselines of this vehicle is that it has to be connected. Um, we have to have uh, real live traffic data uh, hitting the vehicle. Um, so we're, we've partnered with some amazing companies to bring on um, live traffic data, live uh, routing, uh, cloud-based routing. So when you enter a route, we have uh, backend systems calculating and beaming right into the vehicle uh, to ensure we're capturing from and, and computing from billions of, of uh, data points. So again, the, I think this is one of the most fundamental and important aspects of the vehicle. And you'll notice on the right, uh, the digital assistant. Um, again, something we really wanted was something very natural, being able to speak to the vehicle very naturally without having this segmented um, way that typical infotainment systems had. So one of the, the things the amazing voice team brought in was natural language. So now you can easily just say, you know, take me to Laguna Beach or, hey, uh, I need some Tylenol or uh, take me to Disney World. And it automatically brings you these uh, destinations. During the development of this system, the, it was this team, the software development team that said the screen is too small. And we, we had a smaller screen in the car. And yes. they said, you need you need to go and get a bigger screen because the ambitions we've got for this interface will not fit on a a small sideways screen. Um, and, and and so we went and sourced this one and we changed over during the development of the vehicle. It's the heart of heart of the vehicle. And um, full screen nav running is addictive. It, it, all of us, we run with this the whole time. And you can add, a, add on extra information. You can see that info window there. You can add traffic and alerts or you can add food stops or you can add weather and it does the radar for the web, the forecast going further out. You can add extra information to that screen just by clicking one of the bottom, bo- buttons at the bottom, and it's fantastic. So you can have what, what you want on, on that screen. Here you'll notice wireless CarPlay running, uh, but the way we look at it is uh, it's the customer's choice. So it's uh, if you notice a lot of the infotainment systems today, when you open CarPlay or Android Auto, it takes over the entire screen. Um, so we wanted our experience um, to um, also be um, reachable. Uh, we wanted uh, CarPlay and Android Auto to be an app within our system as well. Uh, we wanted to leave it to the customer to kind of live in either world. If you notice here in the video, you'll be able to have you know uh, navigation in CarPlay to listen to radio, flip between the two if you want to. You can also be listening to uh, to music of your applications within CarPlay or Android Auto and uh, be able to use our embedded navigation, um, which we really worked hard to uh, bring in some great user experiences and, and features within our navigation. So 
again, this is giving the customer the choice of what do you want to use? Do you want to use our digital assistant? Do you want to use Apple's digital assistant? Do you want to use Google's digital assistant? So there's several ways we left it to the customer. Kind of in the, we dive into um, show you guys some of the uh, OTA updates. And one of the founding principles of the system is the ability to continuously improve, adapt, um, so as customers, you'll be able to schedule updates, schedule specific times where you want the vehicle to download the updates. And on the next ignition cycle, you're, you're up and ready to go. So um, you, you'll notice as, as uh, customers drive off or receive their vehicles, um, you'll, the vehicle is going to get better over time with continuous improvements. Some cool little features that you'll notice, can't share with them with you guys here. Uh, some that I already showed Darren and others. Uh, they were excited about, but um, again, I think this is this is one area where we didn't compromise, right, Darren? I I, I think this was um, one of the core principles of what we wanted to accomplish with with the system. Absolutely, I mean, every single module on this car is over the air updatable, and we use an AB swap system as well, because if if you download an update on a lot of devices and it starts and it fails, it can leave the device inoperative. This car, every single device, it downloads first. And then when you power, it cycles across and switches to the new. And if anything happens at any time in the vehicle life, it reverts back to what it's got. So it will never leave you uh, stranded or in a difficult position. Yeah. But particularly this system, of course, we're, we're planning many updates. This is just the first go. And I see on the chat talk of what else can we do with that control knob? And we'll be delivering yeah. you new content uh, throughout the whole ownership of the vehicle. This kind of hopefully gave you guys some insight of uh, what we did behind the scenes. Hey guys, welcome. Super excited to show you guys a little behind the scenes of what it took to bring uh, this car to all of you. So let's get in it. This is a design story. So uh, there's kind of two uh, big areas of the design story. One is a human centric approach, which is us designing the car specifically for all of you and having your lifestyle uh, be part of it. And the second part is making it a Mustang. And that was actually a pretty difficult feat too. So we start every program at Ford kind of looking at uh, a core set of values for all the customers that will buy the car. The three priorities that kept coming up were openness, showcase technology, and warmth. Uh, so you can kind of see here on this sketch uh, on the left um, that this super modern cockpit kept coming up in our sketches and had to do with open floating uh, aspects that um, kind of give the essence of lightness and uh, openness to the interior. The showcase technology, you can see on the sketch on the left, was us prioritizing technology differently than we typically do. So this was about um, making the driver's area, the cockpit, um, more about driver controls and minimal information, minimal distraction. And then the last thing on the right here, you can see the warmth. We wanted to bring uh, warmth to what would be a pretty stark interior. So as we took these three key points, uh, we started ideating a lot. So you can see we had a lot of a lot of amazing like sketches and ideas based around how we can showcase the sound system. It's a silent car, so the sound system is super super important. And we wanted to show off uh, basically the sound system we developed with Bang and Olufsen. So we started working with uh, sound bar ideation and how do we show where the sound is coming from and how do we give you that feeling of your living room. You've got the sound bar and your you know big screen TV. Uh, so we wanted to give that feeling of your living room to you a bit and showcase. So this was really, really interesting for us to figure out how we rearranged it. And we started working in the studio with a foam book. It's basically packing peanuts. It's white foam. And we were working with it in the studio, kind of like uh, you could rearrange it and see how uh, you could orient it to better suit your needs and fit your lifestyle. And it was really interesting to see how everybody else did it. Um, so basically, with all these ideas on how you could rearrange the interior, we thought this is a new car. We've got a new platform. Uh, this is a new human centric approach that we're taking. We should do something completely new. And we actually brought a bunch of customers into the design studio and asked them, you know, how how would you live with the interior if you could rearrange it instead of you accommodating to the car? How could we accommodate the car to you? So here you can see one of the, the foam bucks that we sent uh, all over the world. Um, and these are some of the objects that we offered people the, the chance to, to put around. So you've got your iPad, you've got an umbrella, you've got different size purses. People had uh, yoga mats. Um, so everybody had different lifestyle objects they brought with them. And we started rearranging the interior to figure out 
uh, how exactly does your life impact the interior? You can see the sketch in the lower right. There's a big spot for a purse. So this sketch started to reprioritize where things are going in the interior. Um, you can see we've got the sound bar that we're working with here. We're starting to add different fabrics to it to bring some warmth to the interior. Uh, we started playing with different ways to make this uh, center screen really a priority, uh, kind of a centerpiece in the interior. And you can see we started working with the flip up floating armrest that gave us a chance to put a purse or a camera bag or whatever you have with you right there. And that's kind of your spot where you have um, your personal space, a uh, really dedicated area, and then you can stash other belongings that you don't access as often in the door and in the front of the console. I'll pass it on to Rachel and she can explain how we made it a Mustang after this. The first thing we did was think about what are the Mustang iconic um, elements that the interior have. And as, as you can see, the first thing you see in front of you is that sound bar that has the double brow in it, like it's highlighted in this uh, image, and also the waterfall on the door. Those are two of the most iconic uh, design elements in, that you can find in mostly every Mustang. So we decided to incorporate it in our interior. The thing is, um, as Josh was saying in the beginning, this is not a two-door coupe. This is um, SUVs and it's electric. So we wanted to have something different. So this double bra not, also, not only is the icon of Mustang, but it enhanced this big screen, this 15 inch, 15.5 inch screen. Um, so we thought that that would make the perfect frame for it. So uh, both of uh, these elements are highlighted by ambient light, as you can see. So they are visible to your eyes at night. And it's very beautiful how the ambient light uh, lights out the interior. Another cool thing about this mini cluster is that it doesn't have a brow. And, and that was also a big battle because um, a lot of uh, cars now still have a brow, but we managed to do that thanks to um, a, a cover that allows us not to have reflection. So it's perfectly visible in every condition. Here, um, and there's one of the most beautiful parts in the interior as well. So the seats are all new and then are very comfortable, very um, beautiful and simple. It's not leather, but it feels amazing. It's just gorgeous and uh, to the touch, it feels very premium and very comfortable. Another thing you can see by this image is the huge panel roof. This is also beautiful. It's a, a, a fixed glass sunroof and uh, everybody's so concerned about if it gets too heated and, and so on, but it's not because it has a coat that reflects uh, infrared light. So it keeps you actually cooler in the, uh, in the summer. You can see also the detail of the bang in ocean, how precious and detailed it is, the chrome details all around. Like this interior has been studied to the millimeter. Like we wanted to provide the best quality possible for a new electric vehicle owners. The rear seats are one of the most liked parts in the research, strange enough, because a lot of people sat in the back and said, whoa, this is so spaceful. Like it's so open, I can fit. And then a funny thing is we put two of our chief engineers and the trunk is also very big. And once the seat fold, they fold completely flat and it almost doubles uh, the amount of space you, you can use. We have some very special people with us that have spent the last four or five years of their life dedicated to this every day, every minute, every weekend. And that's Ron Heiser, the Chief Program Engineer, and Alina as well. And they're going to talk to you about some of their experiences. No further ado, over to Ron. So I'm going to try and give you a little glimpse in the next few minutes of how we developed the mach -E over the last three years. We optimized the battery package to deliver 300 miles of range, and we moved from front drive to rear wheel drive, all wheel drive. With one of our most critical exercises being selecting the proper rear suspension architecture to meet Mustang handling and package, Mustang handling and having the ability to package our rear drive unit between, between the wheels. We settled quite quickly on our rear multi-link system. All of this had to be done while delivering our attribute targets, including speed and acceleration, people package, ride and handling, and safety, and obviously the, those great exterior looks and, and the interior environment as well. Fortunately, we had great tools and processes. One of those tools is our Ford Racing Simulator in North Carolina. 
Looking at the picture on the left, you can see the cockpit module with 180 degree view. This tool really put us ahead of the game. It in combination with our CAE expertise allowed us to really tune the hardware before we even really physically had the hardware. It guided, it guided and enabled us to improve our body structural rigidity by optimizing the anchoring of the body to the battery pack. Now I'd like to introduce Elena Kapur from our, our electric powertrain engineering team. She's gonna talk a little bit about our development process. I am on the battery electric vehicle uh, team specifically uh, from powertrain calibration. And if you don't know what that is, calibration is like um, we help unify the hardware and the software to make sure that the e-motors in this case, or the electric motors, are accelerating and maneuvering this new Mustang. Our team is in charge of making sure that this car is meeting the aggressive performance targets that the Mustang name has always kind of pushed the boundaries on, um, but we do so much more than that. The guys on the team make sure that the car feels smooth. They're in charge of drivability. We've got people that work on the thermal aspects, making sure that components aren't overheating. They're staying at the correct operating temperature. Um, people that work on powertrain efficiency and making sure you're getting your range. People that work with HMI feedback, such as making sure that the number of miles that you see on the cluster is representative of how much SOC you have left or state of charge um, in your driving characteristics. Um, there's a girl that works on diagnostics and she makes sure that the car is healthy and it tells you if something isn't right. Um, people that work on the climate, making sure your heat and your AC come on properly. A guy that works on the driver automated systems, making sure like adaptive cruise control and your automated uh, parking features are working good. And honestly, so much more. There's there's no way I can put um, everything we do into just one slide. We work very early on in the development, just as the other teams have mentioned, the sink and the interior and exterior teams have mentioned. They all start very early on, and, and we do too. Um, even before we get any sort of hardware, we work with our vehicle models and simulations to do as much testing and development as we possibly can. And then when we do get the hardware, um, we will take kind of the guts of this thing and put it in these non-representative exteriors so we can begin our work right away. And um, part of our job is to make sure, yes, that your daily general driving experience is exciting and it allows you to feel that quickness of the car. But we also make sure that the car is capable in the extreme heat or the cold um, going up and down steep hills or mountains or driving on different surfaces. So um, we take these cars and we will test them in different parts of the country. While we do take these vehicles and put them in the harshest uh, environments that we can out in the wild, we do a lot of testing in labs as well. And so this is a photo from a guy in the team doing some testing, which in this situation, in this lab, you're looking at this car on a what's called a dynamometer, if you're not familiar. So the, the car is stationary and the wheels are on these rolling mechanisms. So it allows us to test this um, while it's in one place. And it gives us the opportunity to test in these different conditions when they might not be available easy to us um, out on the road. So we can simulate uh, hot weather when it's cold outside or cold weather when it's hot outside. We can simulate going up or down a steep hill or, or mountain. I would say a question I get asked a lot is, how will it perform in the cold? And I, what I'll say to you that if this car didn't perform in Michigan, we're in a lot of trouble. And so you'll find that the door locks open fully, no problem in Michigan, <clears throat> even when it rains and it gets cold in the snow. And you'll find the powertrain system amazing and you'll find all of the aspects of the car, like the heating and everything about it, will perform really well in all of these conditions. That's really important to us. So maybe this is probably the most important feature to the team or to most people who will get to drive the car, but it's the level of acceleration that you feel, that, that instantaneous torque. And so what you're looking at here is that magnitude versus when you take the accelerator pedal and you mash it to the floor, 
in the Mach E, which is that blue line there, you're going to feel peak acceleration within the first half second and compare that to a, a two, three liter Mustang, which is still a fast car, but you get to that level of acceleration a little bit later. So I'm going to hand it back over to Ron. He's going to talk a little bit more about the uh, new drive driving. So what was really important for us is what we call the new joy of driving. You know, BEVs give you an opportunity to do something different. Uh, if you have the right electrical architecture, it gives you the opportunity to do something different with your HMI, meaning your, your center screen and your cluster and so forth. Uh, it gives you the opportunity also to, you know, differentiate uh, how you amplify or turn down certain uh, attributes. And we're able to do that, uh, you know, by tailoring the pedal map differently for the different experiences. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about each in a minute. We can tailor the interior lighting to each of the experiences. We can tailor the HMI coming off of the cluster differently for each experience. And, and really, we have the ability to amp up or tune down uh, the, the powertrain sound and the feedback that comes from the powertrain inside of the cabin. What we came up with was three different experiences. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is Engage. That's probably what most people coming out of an ICE would be familiar with. And, and what I'm really talking about here is the pedal map, the tip in and the tip out. You know, how aggressive is the tip in? It's still, it's obviously going to have instantaneous torque, so it's going to surprise people. But the tip out feels more like your, you know, you know a, a typical um, ice vehicle would feel on engine braking, but we're doing it all with, re, with the regen system. Then you move to one end of the extreme, which is unbridled. And, and unbridled, really unleashes a little bit more. Um, it's a much more aggressive tip in, and it has much more aggressive uh, regenerative braking when you lift off of the accelerator pedal. Um, I like to de describe it as almost gives you a kick down effect if you wanna really drive the car really hard. So now I'm gonna move to the other end of the extreme, which is whisper. Whisper, Whisper is a really peaceful and serene drive, but we didn't we didn't mute the performance. We've we've uh, reduced the the pedal map a little bit on tip in, uh, but if you stop it and whisper, you're getting the full acceleration that you're going to get in unbridled. So it's not like a detuned experience. I don't want people walking out of here thinking that. And I I, I really kind of go back and forth between unbridled and whisper on which one I want to drive in. Um, above all of these, we offer the capability of one pedal drive. So in any one of these drive experiences, you can drive in one pedal or in two pedal drive. And we, and we think one pedal is just, it's, it's mandatory to provide uh, on a BEV. It, it gives you a completely different type of a drive experience and it, and it actually makes it quite fun. An extreme amount of work has gone into working on that one pedal drive and it integrates fully with the brakes most systems with one pedal on most electric cars do not we had to there's a piece of equipment in the car that blends those two in and that means that when you drive one one pedal and you come to a stop it holds the car in position it does that by blending the brakes in so you can stop on an upward hill and it will hold or a downward hill and it will hold it also is not overly aggressive to make the car uncomfortable or to shock you. It has both. It's up front and it's easy to turn on and off. So the, the customer has the choice in all three modes, but we're, we're going to deliver it with it switched on. Um, one thing is we came at charging as a, in a human-centered way. Um, it seems like a simple thing, um, but the more you get into it, the more complex it is. A, a, a petrol gas pump, fuel comes out, you put it in, it fills up and you're done. A, a electric charging station, it can be one phase, two phase, three phase, DC, AC, and all different levels in between with all different charging rates and, and so on. And then there's at home level two as well, and or level three plugging into a socket. It's confusing as hell. And what, what we 
sought to do with this vehicle is to simplify that for people, make the choices easy, make the car automatically include charging and what you need to do a journey so the customer doesn't have to go through those issues. The vehicle comes with what you need. There's a cable in the back that charges the vehicle at a reasonable rate, and all you really need is a socket. That will charge your car for most people every night, no problem. And it's not very expensive to have that put in. Also, we have a connected box. The connected box has also wireless connectivity and you can control it via Ford Pass. Um, so it's also nice and convenient, looks nice on the wall. So that's your choice. I mentioned it's tied to Ford Pass and you can control, but it's different in every area. Some areas have time sensitive charging, some it's after a certain time, some you have a meter put in and a meter seven. It's different in every region and the incentives are different as well. The car is prepared for all of these. You can program it only to charge at certain times or charge when you want it to or charge if it's a variable rate to do it at different times on the variable rate to be at a certain amount when you leave in the morning and so on. You have that flexibility to make it charge the way you want to. And it's fully over the air updatable. So we'll keep updating it as we learn. And if the customers, if you decide that you don't like something, we're getting feedback, we'll change it again. Um, but it, it's very nice. And the app is very, very nice. It's um, you can, you've got full control over the car and opening and closing and unlocking and locking and preparing it for when you arrive and charging and seeing when the charging is and when it's going to finish and when the car's going to be prepared for you in the morning and when it prepares for you at night. All those things are on the app. I mentioned it gets ready in the morning, so um, you can program it like a Nest thermostat. You can program it to be ready for you in the morning or it's going to start to predict as well and get ready for you. Because there's no emissions, it can get ready for you in the garage while it's programmed and say to you, I got ready and I warmed up, is that okay? Um, and it's gonna learn more and more and do those things like that for you. So that when you get in, it's already up to temperature or already cooled down um, so that you, you, and if you're plugged in, you're not wasting your precious power get, getting the vehicle there. It takes surprising a surprisingly high amount of power to, to get the vehicle ready with temperature and once it's there it's much easier to maintain so it's a good idea to to do that preparation so we're going to help you do that a lot of questions on charging networks um and we'll answer some of those specifically but key is we wanted to put together uh, the charging network that you need for your use on a daily basis and your journeys the ad charges tell you the amount of time you need to be there and you can adjust that. If you don't like one of the locations, you can change that as well. You have full control over that. The key is you don't have to think about it. You just say where you want to go and the car knows where all the charges are, takes you there, pays for the charging and tells you how long you need to charge there and you just get on with your journey. That was the whole idea of this. Well, thanks everybody for your time and attention. We really hope you enjoyed that and we were able to share some new facts and information about Mustang Mach-E that you didn't already know. We're now going to move into our Q&A, and we invite you, if you haven't already, to join us on Twitter and send in your questions. I'll be on hand with the Mustang Mach-E team to take time to answer all of your questions. Please submit them by your local Ford Twitter account, and our community managers will be on hand to work through the questions as quickly as possible. Best wishes from all of us at Ford, to you, your families and friends. We can't wait to see your reactions once the car starts to arrive in the new year. Thanks again for all the support and interest you've shown us. Mm -hmm.